Hi everyone and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's so nice to have shared an alumni, students, faculty, and staff, and members of our community with us tonight. My name is Leslie Dean and I'm the alumni manager here at Sheridan College. As always, we miss seeing you all in person, but it's so nice that we can still reconnect virtually. Don't forget that Sheridan Alumni's office is here to support you, so don't hesitate to reach out to us, share your ideas for events, ask questions, and of course, to share your great news with us. We are so excited to welcome back Ted Parks, photographer and cinematographer who studied here at Sheridan and now owns Teddy B. Honey. Ted, along with the team at Sheridan, including Sheridan Student Union and Professor Anna Washels, have added a little sweet note to the college's sustainability initiatives and brought four beehives to our Sheridan campuses. Two of the hives are located at our Trafalgar campus in Oakville, and the other two are located at our Davis campus in Brampton. All hives are located in remote areas at the college to ensure our bees are uninterrupted and are able to continue their business in peace. Tonight, we will expand your knowledge and feed your interest in bees as we talk about pollination and the important roles bees play in our environment. We are also going to screen a short video that we created a couple weeks ago on campus with Ted to show you Sheridan's new beehives and venture inside them to look at the bees and the honey in them. After our video airs, we will do a live Q&A with Ted where you can ask him all your buzzing questions about bees. Please type your questions in the chat box that's located on the right hand side of your screen at any time during the event and I will read out the questions uh, to Ted after the video airs. With that being said, I think it's now time to start learning about bees. Please join me in watching the buzz around Sheridan. Hi, I'm Ted Parks and I am the owner of Teddy Bee Honey Company and also a Sheridan College alumni. I have installed four hives here on the Sheridan 2 here in, in uh, Oakville and a couple of hives in uh, Brampton at the campus there. And this whole initiative was uh, brought on by the Sheridan College Student Union Association uh, with Kyle Budge as the president and uh, my contact and liaison through all of this has been Dan Casey. Teddy Bee Honey Company is a boutique apiary, as I call it, uh, running about 40 hives. Uh, and I think on my website, I say pampered hives. Um, and I also have a few other, uh, you know, corporate green roof uh, hive hosting clients uh, in the city of Toronto. The philosophy behind Teddy Bee Honey is that uh, we manage the bees as holistically as possible. We don't use any harsh chemicals uh, unless absolutely necessary to, for the survival of the hive or the bees. And um, fortunately, there's been a big movement towards uh, more natural treatments for the bees and some of the, the pests that we now have to, uh, have to deal with, uh, that that has become a bit of an easier task than in years past. So on that note, uh, let's, uh, let me maybe take you through one of the hives and we can uh, take it apart and I can show you some of the uh, differences of the bee cast, the drone, the queen, and the worker bees. And uh, we can take a look into the hives right here behind us. Here I have my bee belt. Um, I have a, a marker for marking the queen, although uh, we shouldn't really need that today. Um, I do have a queen cage in case I want to put the queen in a safe spot while I'm inspecting the hive. And then this is uh, the hive tool. And this, uh, this belt is actually the creation of a beekeeper that runs the University of Guelph uh, beekeeper, Beekeeping Research Center, Honey Bee Research Center. Uh, so uh, it's, it's a local made belt. The first thing we're going to do is uh, add a little, put a little smoke to the, to the hive. Just get this going a little better. The purpose of the smoke is twofold. One is it, uh, when the bees smell the smoke, they're thinking forest fire. So they will go down into the hive and start feeding on honey. They'll gorge themselves on honey to, uh, to make sure they have as much energy as possible if they have to flee. The other thing it does is that it, it masks the pheromone uh, of the hive. 
So if a bee gets upset, then it will not be able to signal to the other bees that I'm here, and that way I won't get stung or stung as much. The smoker is, uh, you can use a variety of different fuels for your smoker. I mean, I'm using wood chips or wood shavings. I mean, there's some commercially available pellets as well as, you know, some people use pine needles, burlap, but there's a variety of things. As long as it's natural or, or made specifically for bees, you know, you don't, don't want to just throw old garbage or anything like that in there, of course. So what we have here is, uh, in this configuration, we have the bottom box is what we call the brood box. That's where the queen is housed and the queen's laying and, and all the young bees are being raised in this bottom box. These other two boxes, because we're here in mid-season, um, are what we call the honey supers. So these two boxes are what the bees are actually moving and storing the honey to. So we'll have a look in there first. So the thing with the bees is just to be sort of slow and methodical, not any big banging moments and what have you. So I'll just put a little smoke on the top here. We'll pull out one of these, one of these frames here and I can show you Sheridan College's uh, student union's first honey harvest or honey. Okay, so what we have here, this is actually a great frame. So this is all honey. So the bees, they, they collect the nectar. They actually have two stomachs, one for food and one for nectar. And they come back from foraging and they regurgitate the nectar along with some enzymes and stuff from their stomach that creates the honey. Here we'll see this is all capped honey. So that's a wax capping that they put on. And they don't do that until the honey is at the exact proper moisture uh, content. So if there's too much moisture in the honey, it will ferment and go bad. But the bees know exactly when the honey gets to that proper moisture content and then they cap it, at which point then it lasts forever. Honey never goes bad. So they got a little bit of work to do on this one, but it's, it's nice that they've started capping. With this humid weather, it sometimes takes them a little longer to, to get the honey all capped. Go a little further in. So these are heavy and they sometimes get welded together with with wax and what have you. We'll also notice that I'm not wearing a bee suit. When the weather's nice like today, the bees are pretty happy and content to be out foraging. As long as I don't do anything too crazy, they don't feel threatened. And they're not necessarily or usually aggressive by nature. Uh, the reason I'm scraping the tops on this is that they build wax and they weld the boxes together. So this is an opportunity for me is to clean the top bars off so that the next time I come, I don't have to fight the, the boxes all welded together again. Because the bees, uh, they will fill every single available space with wax and honey. So now we're gonna pry this off. So this gray thing that we're revealing here is what we call a queen excluder. So what it is, the queen is about twice as large as a worker bee. So this excluder prevents the queen from being able to travel up into the boxes where we're collecting the honey. Because if she was allowed to, to come up into these boxes, she'd be laying eggs and brood in, in our honey, which makes it just a lot more difficult to harvest. So we put the excluder on to, to contain the queen to this bottom part of the hive. Okay, so this is where the queen lays all the eggs and raises all the broods. Although this was a new hive in the spring, uh, which was actually just four frames with bees on it, it, they have now built themselves out to be all 10 frames. There's probably roughly 50,000 bees as part of this colony right now, um, with a large percentage of them out foraging uh, on the flowers and stuff. So we just have to be really careful as we pull this first frame out, especially that we don't accidentally crush the queen. So on this frame, what we have, um, which is actually, we've got a little bit of everything, which is kind of almost an ideal frame. Here on the very corners, we have a little bit of honey, which is stored there. Then working towards the center, we have pollen. You can see the different colors and the shininess of the pollen that's in those frames here. 
And then in the very center, the, the light brown cells that we see are actually, that's brood. Those are eggs and larva and pupa as the in different stages in that frame. You can see it all. Okay, so you like, like look at the brood here on the back. That's beautiful. As a beekeeper, this is a real nice frame. And this is on the outside. As we work through the hive, we're going to see all kinds. Okay, so I'm going to set this frame here gently so we have some room to work in the hive. So in Ontario, we have about 400 species of native bees. And actually, the Euro European honeybee is not one of them. Actually, these honeybees are not native to North America. They were actually brought over from Europe in the 17th century. I mean, there are a lot of misconceptions about honeybees in particular. I mean, a lot of people don't understand the difference between the honeybee and the wasps and stuff. Uh, for example, the honeybee is not interested in your barbecue. If, uh, if there's bees buzzing around your, your outdoor dinner, then it's most likely a wasp. It's not a honeybee. Honeybees are not necessarily aggressive by nature. If they feel threatened, they will sting you, but that is kind of the extent of it. As a beekeeper, this is a fantastic frame. I mean, for mid-season, to have it wall-to-wall -wall brood like this, is the queen is very strong, laying well. It's a nice, even brood pattern. Well, the brood is actually the capped bee cells. Behind every one of these cells that's capped in the tan color, uh, will be a new bee. So this hive, the population of this hive is going to continue to be very, very strong going forward through the summer. And uh, given the fact that the lifespan of a honeybee during the summer is about four weeks, they literally work themselves to death in four weeks. Wow. And during that lifespan, they will produce one twelfth of a teaspoon of honey. So the jar of honey you have on in your cupboard is a product of probably about 500 bees and their entire life. So this is a very healthy, thriving hive at the moment. The one thing as a beekeeper that we do have to you know, fight against is a parasite called the Varroa mite, which has been attributed to you know, most of the decline of the honeybees. It's a, a parasite that attaches itself to the backs of the bees feeds off their hemoglobin and their and their fat cells and it compromises their immune system once that immune system has been compromised then the bees are susceptible to a multiple of multiple other diseases so at any given point in the season the bees will always have the idea that if something happens to the queen that they can nurture a new queen uh, fairly quickly so here on this frame we actually have some queen cells. So here you can see that the queen cells here, these two right here, they're raised cells pointing downwards versus the flat cells of the, of the larva for the worker bees. And actually this frame kind of shows, I'll just have to hold it a little more like this. So we have queen cells here, which are, you know, stick out and they're facing downward. And then here, for example, this is just normal brood female worker bee, bee uh, cells. And then here, this lumpy brood here, those are drone cells. And again, the drones are uh, larger bees, so they, they require a larger cell. Well, actually, we have a bee emerging as we speak right here. See the right there where my thumb is? Yes. So that, focus on that for a minute. yeah, so here we have uh, a couple of worker bees emerging from the cells. So they will chew their way out of the wax capping that's on their cell once they're ready to emerge. And a new worker bee, we can see them in the hive because they're a little fuzzier. They're, they're born with a fair amount of little fuzzy fur and, and stuff. So, And actually, when they're first born like this, they do have a stinger, but it's not developed enough to be able to actually sting. So the, the majority of the hive are worker bees. Uh, they're all females, and they look after the hive uh, in the sense of that they do all the housework, the cleaning, they forage for all the nectar and pollen, they nurture the queen, they kept the queen, they feed the queen um, and produce all the honey and the wax. The drones are the male bees. 
don't do much. Their only sole purpose is to mate with a virgin queen. So um, only a small percentage of the bees in the hive are drones. They're usually, we'll see one here in a second, they're quite a lot larger than the worker bees. Uh, they do not sting. They basically don't really have any function inside the hive except for to propagate with queens. And the queen, a virgin queen, makes one or two mating flights and mates with multiple drones during those flights. And then she is then mated for life. She will never fly or mate again. So as the queen ages inside the hive, um, and the hive is sort of held together with uh, pheromones from the queen, once the queen starts to age or has any kind of health issues, that pheromone level starts to decline. And that will signal the hive to plan succession and start nurturing a new queen. And that point, they take advantage of those queen cells that we just looked at. And as a new queen is born, the old queen and the new queen will literally fight it out to the death. There's actually only one queen in each hive. The entire health of the hive is dictated by the queen from a laying standpoint and population wise. And as we can see here with the amount of brood that we have and eggs and larva that this queen is actually doing very well. And which is to be expected because this was a, a new queen this year. Well, a queen can live about four years successfully. During the mating, the queen uh, with the drone, she stores millions of sperm in her abdomen. And that's why she's quite a lot larger than the rest of the bees. And those millions of sperm are what fertilize. So the queen mates once and has enough sperm stored to continue laying 2,000 eggs a day during the peak of summer, you know, for three or four years. The gestation period is different for each of the different bees. Um, the, a queen bee is actually reared the quickest. It's, it's 16 days from egg to queen. And a worker bee is 21 days, uh, 23 or four days for a drone. Every four weeks during the summer, the entire population of the hive rolls over once because of the worker bees, you know, work themselves to death in, in four weeks. The queen has to replace those 50,000 bees every four weeks. So for the queen, the laying process peaks around the summer solstice and then the opposite is true that the fewest you know the queen lays virtually nothing at uh, the winter solstice the big issue for winter survival is not necessarily the cold they can withstand the cold quite well they cluster really tight together and they can actually keep the center of the hive at about 35 degrees year round uh, as the days get shorter the queen recognizes the fact that uh, winter is coming and she'll start laying fewer and fewer eggs. And with that, uh, the population starts to decline and the bees will start storing all the space that was normally for brood like this, they will store honey in it. And that's their nutrients for the winter. But it takes an, an extraordinary amount of energy for them to do that. And that energy comes from the honey that, they're, that they feed on and that's stored in the hive. So as a beekeeper, we have to manage that balance between the amount of honey that we take off, when we take this honey off, and how much we leave for the hive to, to survive the winter with. Um, you know, the thing is, as beekeepers, we do everything we can to keep the hive as healthy and as sustainable as possible. There's, there's no reason a beekeeper would want to risk losing a hive through winter by, you know, being greedy and taking too much honey. Usually when that happens, it's by mistake or, or a situation arose that was sort of unpredicted, like a, like a very early fall turnaround of weather that may take us by surprise, as Mother Nature is so capable of doing. So come winter, this hive is reduced to just this box. These other boxes are not part of the, the winter hive. And we do wrap them just to help them maintain the, the heat and save their heat. So we'll put a bit of insulation under the lid and we put a wrap around the hive just to protect it from the weather and the elements a little bit. And that's all we really do. We don't have to do a lot more than that. So it's a pretty simple process. Originally, I was attracted to beekeeping because I read an article about colony collapse disorder. 
I think it was in National Geographic. And in the very beginning, they had no idea what was causing an entire healthy hive like this to be here one day and for the beekeeper to come back a couple of days later and the box would be nearly empty and not a sign of any of the dead bees. And uh, there was all kinds of crazy theories in the beginning about cell towers and it's taken a long time for them to discover that in all likelihood, those scenarios were probably pesticide poisoning. Um, but on top of that pesticide poisoning, the biggest threat to bees in the population is the varroa destructor, the varroa mite, and, and the immune compromise that, that's created by those. And so as a beekeeper with honeybees, uh, we do have a lot greater loss. There's a lot more work to keeping the bees healthy than ever before. But we are managing the the colonies much differently now. And with that, we've been relatively or quite a bit more successful than, than say a decade ago. The bigger issue is the wild bees, the native bees, because they are also suffering from many of the same issues of climate change and, and different strains of disease that the honeybees are suffering from, but without the management or the benefit of the management. So, um, you know, bumblebees in particular, with climate change and habitat loss. Um, there's over 400 different species of native bees in Ontario, and uh, they're all out there fending for themselves. So um, when I first started keeping bees, it was really to just to do my part to, you know, have some bees in my backyard and uh, the benefit of the, the bees pollinating the gardens and stuff. So one of the things that people can do at home is plant pollinator friendly you know, plants and flowers, as well as for the native bees, if there's an area that, of their backyard that they can let go a little bit wild, uh, that's also a great advantage. Um, but some of the, you know, beef friendly or pollinator friendly plants, you know, are, you know, lavender, corn flowers, sunflowers, uh, you know, flocks. Uh, I know most people think them of weeds, but thistles, uh, I mean, there's, there's quite a variety and even, uh, uh, you know, your local nursery can certainly point you in the right direction. Uh, certain herbs like sage and stuff, the bees are, are attracted to as well. So there are things that you can do without actually physically keeping bees in your backyard. Thanks uh, for joining me in this presentation. Um, it's always nice to be able to explain some of the beekeeping uh, techniques and and uh, offer a little more understanding of honeybees. They're, they're quite often misunderstood and the importance of them in the ecosystem. So it's, um, you know, it's really great that the Sheridan College uh, Student Union has taken this initiative and uh, brought the bees to campus. So if you have any questions, uh, I'm available for, for any uh, thing you might want to ask in the, in the next short while. Thanks. That was great. What a very informative and educational video. Hi, Ted. Hi. I feel like I, was... I just I just saw you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you did. I mean, a little different setting than yeah. uh, than this, but yeah, I, yeah, that no, was uh, yeah. They did a good job putting all that together. So. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We really, really appreciate your time and you know you helping make that video with us. It was so much fun. I was lucky enough to be there uh, with you, and it was just so eye-opening, and it was just a wealth of information. I came home talking about bees, and it was just you know lots of great learning for myself, um, and I'm sure others tonight also enjoyed it. So, first of all, good. I hear. Where are you right now? I feel like you're not in your home. <laughs> no, I'm actually, uh, my other job, as you mentioned off the top, uh, I'm a cinematographer. So right now I'm on the set of Working Moms and we're filming on location in Mississauga. So, so cool. That's yeah. awesome. It's a, so. it's a sidebar, yeah. but a great show, everyone who hasn't seen it. It's an, it's an awesome show and it's always great knowing, you know, our, our, Former Sheridan uh, grads and students are part of these Canadian films. So thank you for your effort. So, yeah. so before we get into it, I just want to remind everyone, if you do have those questions, to please enter them in the chat, and I will be more than happy to read them out on your behalf to Ted. So I'll kind of get the ball rolling here. Um, 
I think we should kind of just jump right into stuff. Um, one thing that I think people would really want to know is for those of us who are going back on campus, you know, we slowly have our staff and faculty uh, returning back to our campuses uh, this fall. What should we expect from the hives and how should we act around them if we come across them? Uh, well, the hives themselves are tucked away a little bit, so you'd have to be kind of exploring the, the far corners of the campuses to, to come across the hives. Um, but really, you don't have to be terribly alarmed when you do run into them. I mean, ideally, you keep a distance. Yes. Um, they're, you know, particularly at the front of the hive, the, the bees are coming and going. It's, uh, it's quite a sort of a highway of bees as they fly in and out. But uh, yeah, they shouldn't be, you know, anything to, you know, concern yourself with. So, yes, you know, we just, just keep worried. a distance. Keep a distance. We shouldn't be worried about getting stung at all, right? No, they're not aggressive unless they're, you know, feel threatened. And, uh, you know, if you were standing, say, you know, in the front of the hive or whatever, uh, you know, one might get caught in your hair or something like that. And, you know, you could get stung that way. But, you know, to stand back at a distance and just uh, watch the bees coming and going on the uh, in and out of the box uh, shouldn't be an issue whatsoever. Great, great. So. Um, okay, so we do have one audience question. So first and foremost, they said that was terrific. So great job. Um, do you offer Thanks. any beekeeping courses? I don't at the moment. Um, perhaps eventually I, I will. Um, you know, it's a bit of a, you know, and perhaps without COVID, I may have already been to that stage. But, sure. um, you know, part of it is... Uh, uh, just having all the aids, you know, the visual aids and stuff that you would need and bee suits and stuff like that. So I haven't really ventured that way in a venue where I would host something like that. But uh, uh, at the moment, I, if, it, if somebody's interested in a beekeeping course, I recommend the courses that are either offered through the Ontario Beekeepers Association, the OBA, or the University of Guelph Honeybee Research Center. Um, both of them are absolutely top-notch uh, programs and, and they offer a variety of courses for you know, everybody with and without bees and, you know, amateur or uh, experienced beekeepers alike. For sure. So. So that, that was, that's a great resource. That's great. Well, if you ever do end up teaching corporate courses, please keep us in mind because it seems that we have quite the appetite from our alumni. So keep us, that could be our next event. How about that? Right. <laughs> Sounds good. Awesome. Okay. Um, so you, you briefly mentioned it in your video, but can you just reiterate the difference between the worker bee and the drone bee? Okay, so the worker bees, uh, which uh, constitute the majority of the bees in the hive, uh, are all females. And they are actually the smallest bee in the hive. Um, the drone bees are actually quite big and chunky. You know, they're, they're noticeably larger, a little huskier. They have bigger eyes. Um, so in the hive, it is fairly easy to distinguish between the, between the two, but, uh, when they're out flying around, it, it is difficult to tell the difference between the two. Um, yeah. yeah, drones, uh, you know, tend to be a little fuzzier than, than the worker bees, but I would admit for the majority of people, it would be, be hard to tell. Right. So, right. You know, yes. And I did find that interesting that, you know, they do have such a specific role and like that is their purpose. And even just how you said in your video that the worker bees literally work themselves to death. Yeah. I found that very interesting. Like they do. Yeah. One point. other note about the drones is that the hive actually kicks all the drones out for the winter. Oh, they actually, okay. they're actually thrown out and, and die. Um, Okay. Over, you know, late in the fall, um, because they serve no purpose over winter. Huh, so there's nice. there's no there's no mating going to happen over winter. So they're expelled from the from the hive, and because they're just mouths that don't need to be fed for the winter. Yeah. And the queen will lay unfertilized eggs, which create the drones uh, in early spring. Oh, okay. So there'll be a new crop of drones in the early spring. So um, that's so interesting. Yeah. Very so, interesting. Yeah, it's a mini Game of Thrones or right, yeah. right in the hive. So. It's a good reference. Good way to put yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. So. That's great. Okay, thank you for that. Um, okay, just a couple more questions from the audience. So um, one person said, thank you so much for sharing. Um, they have two questions for you. 
Um, so have you worked with native bees before in some way? That's question one. And question two is, is there any way to get involved as an alumni to keep learning about beekeeping on campus? And I can help you with that one. If you want to. Uh, to yeah, go ahead. Yeah, maybe you can. Yeah, so a great in. way to keep learning about bees as, a, as an alumni. Obviously, we love hosting workshops like this. And, you know, since we now have hives on campus, I'm sure um, ourselves, uh, Sheridan Alumni, Sheridan College, and Sheridan Student Union will be able to be providing updates as the colonies progress over time and letting everyone know about all the fun stuff that our, hive, our beehives are up to on campus. So stay tuned for more information to come once it becomes available. Once our hives uh, continue to grow and flourish, we'll be more than happy to update our audience with that. Right. And the other half of the question, as far as native bees go, I haven't really worked directly uh, with much in the way of native bees, but I am also part creator of a show for TVO, which is strictly all about pollinators. And it's geared for, towards children, uh, you know, sort of 11, you know, 12 year olds. And uh, that show, I believe, starts airing in the fall and it, it explores uh, a variety of different pollinators that we have here so I love that yeah. I love being able to teach kids at a young age about it right because I feel like bees are such like a misled um, species right everyone's afraid of bees so to teach them at a young age the importance of it is is awesome uh, yeah absolutely so great it's, it's all good info yeah absolutely okay another great question this one's quite interesting so they would like to know, do you have to remove all the extra queen cells before they hatch since you have a new queen this year? Or in the third or fourth year, would you have to leave a couple queen cells? Uh, well, actually, we do usually, you know, eliminate the queen cells, mm -hmm. um, particularly in the spring, because the hives tend to build up very rapidly in the spring. And what we're trying to control is is swarming and swarming happens if the hive population grows too fast too quickly and they get a little overcrowded in the hive the queen will the, well the hive the colony will rear a new queen and the old queen leaves and takes half the bees with it uh -huh. and that's when you see the big ball of bees hanging from a branch in the tree or you know on the eve of your house yes. um, which as a beekeeper is not something you want to see happen um, going forward as the queen's productivity starts declining, uh, we do replace the queens. Uh, most, well, I wouldn't say that. I mean, uh, I, I don't use the process of letting them raise their own queen happen. Uh, I tend to, uh, remove the existing queen and replace the queen with a queen from a queen breeder. Mm -hmm. Um, that way you're, you're guaranteeing the genetics. Um, if you let the hive supersede, uh, with the new queen on its own, uh, you're not sure what or where the drones have come from that she's mated right. with. And so, um, you know, I mean, it, it was the way it was done for, you know, hundreds, yeah. hundreds of years before now. Um, so there isn't really anything wrong with that except for, I prefer to be able to control the genetics uh, okay. of the hive, uh, in particular the the uh, you know how aggressive they are, the the, the temperament of the hive, and, and what have you is really all dictated by the queen. So we and uh, hygienic behavior and things that they're they're selectively breeding for now is is a big advantage to us beekeepers. Right, so. absolutely. So I just want to circle back to one thing you said. So what is a uh, a queen bee breeder? So that's someone who you that's know, a, bee you, a beekeeper. Yeah, that's a beekeeper okay. who uh, who raises queens. They breed queens, uh, you know, specifically for sale. Okay. And uh, we have a great program in Ontario called Orbs, which is the Ontario Ontario. Res Resist, yeah, resistant, Ontario resistant uh, bee selection and orbs. And it's a program that's run through the OBA tech transfer program. And they, uh, they continuously, I mean, you just basically keep breeding from your best stock. Sure. Right. So that, you know, each generation, um, 
is coming from the best stock you have in your in your apiary and uh with that it it just propagates more you know best uh best beehive you know best queens so and productive queens so so cool i love yeah. it i love it <laughs> yeah it's big big business actually so yeah. you know they sell queens by the thousands so wow and, amazing. and and they sell all over the world you know for example like you know queens local queens here in ontario aren't available to us beekeepers until the end of june uh, just because it takes that long for the hives to get up and running and for there to be drones and what have you to mate with, with new queens. So if I, for any reason, want a new queen before June in the yeah. spring, I mean, I can get them from New Zealand, Australia, Chile, um, you know, and then vice versa because our seasons are opposite with, with oh. you know, Australia, New Zealand and what have you. Then the, the opposite is true for our queen breeders um, in the fall, they're shipping bees to, you know, for spring yeah. in, in New Zealand and Australia and what have you. So that's so true. I didn't think about the mixed season. So that's really beneficial. Yeah. And it's, yeah. it's great to see like it is an international initiative, right? Like that's pretty cool. The, you know, being able to lean on each other, different countries helping each other out like that. That's really true. Neat. That's awesome. Okay, we have another question about where the beehives are located on our campuses. So I mentioned we have two at Trafalgar, two at our Brampton locations. But mm -hmm. whereabouts on campus are they? And were those locations picked specifically? Uh, the, yes, the, the locations were picked specifically uh, to be a little out of the way. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, just to, the less disturbed they are, the, the better off they are. For sure. Um, but uh, for example, in Oakville campus, if you did want to walk by them, they're down by the sports field. Yeah. Uh, the end of parking lot six. Um, and they're just uh, sort of tucked there uh, beside a couple of cedar trees. And then uh, in, in Brampton at the Davis campus, uh, they're actually sort of tucked in behind the maintenance area of the okay. campus, which is sort of the far east side of of the grounds uh, just above the pond so got it, got it. and were they familiar yeah were they picked there as well because there was lots of you know pollinators around or just mostly because it was in a nice remote location yeah both campus has both campuses have lots of green space and lots of yeah. you know natural foliage and you know plants and stuff like that so um and the bees are capable of foraging quite a distance from the hive so it was more just to be a little out of the way, you know, so it doesn't attract too much attention. Um, you know, you don't certainly don't want any mischief around the hives. Not sure why anybody would want to, you know, <laughs> tamper with them, but uh, you know, just so they weren't right, sure. right there in the front and center. And and for the be, you know, the people that are a little apprehensive and stuff, it's it's not something they're going to run into in all You're likelihood. Right. So. Yeah, and I, I believe when we were there, um, I believe it was you or the Sheridan Student Union put out a couple signs that say like, bees at work, kind of keep, you know, keep your distance, FYI, they're, they're close by, which is great. Yes, yeah, both, both uh, locations have signage up, so. That's great, good. Awesome, okay, this is um, another interesting question, so, are the Sheridan hives in any danger from skunks or raccoons? Uh, no. I mean, no. skunks and raccoons don't really cause too much trouble uh, with the hives. Um, again, the defensive behavior of the bees sure. will, will, you know, sort of keep those animals at bay. Uh, the biggest threat to you know, the beehives out in bee yards and stuff like that, which isn't something we have to deal with uh, in in town are, are bears, oh. you know, bears are a big issue, uh, you know, when you get into the northern part of the province and stuff, sure. but, uh, you know, there isn't really anything that causes too much, you know, uh, damage to the hives. Right. Um, occasionally there'll be like blue jays or woodpeckers, but like blue jays in particular will be eating some of the bees off the front of the hive, but oh. it, they don't eat enough to cause any kind of real damage. So. Got it. Got it. And is the the bears is kind of like the tale of they want the honey, right? Is that legit what's going on? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, actually, it depends on the time of year. They're also after the brood because of the protein of all the larvae. 
Okay. So, so uh, it's not just the honey, but it's it's also the the brood is is full of protein and stuff for them. So, um, yeah, they basically eat everything. To be honest <laughs> with you. <clears throat> And and quite often it's more damaged, like they, they knock them over and then they just, you know, yeah. paw through it and stuff. Yeah. And, uh, it's more, you know, I mean, there's obviously the loss of bees, but it's also the damage to the equipment as well. So. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, we wouldn't want that to happen. Good thing we don't have bears nearby. No, no. <laughs> Great. Thank you for that. Um, so another question is, um, they said they may have missed this already, but other than making babies, do the drones have any other jobs in the hives? Do they gather the pollen and bring it back to the hive? Or is it that once they're out, they're out of the hive for good? Um, well, they live, you know, in the hive. They come and go and, and what have you. Uh, mostly live in the hive. They're not out flying very often because they don't have to. Right. Um, you know, they have everything they need inside the hive, but they, no, they don't serve any other purpose, but procreation. That's it. Right. They, they wow. don't contribute to the hive in any other form. Got it. So. so interesting. Yeah. It really is interesting. All their roles, like it's very, and that's the way they're, they're born into that role. Right. It's just, that's, this yeah. is your, this is your position. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, okay, does, how does half the hive know to leave with the new queen? I think they're mentioning your other um, answer. Right. How does half the hive know to leave with the new queen or decide to stay with the old queen? That's a very good question that I don't have an answer for, to be honest <laughs> with you. I mean, it's, it's nature's way to, yes. you know, to propagate the species as a whole. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I hadn't actually thought about it, but perhaps the next time I talk to somebody that knows much more about bees than I do, I'll, I'll ask that question, but For sure. um, um, yeah, enough bees are left behind to, to make sure that the existing hive survives and goes forward. And, and the, you know, the new bees with the existing queen with the, the bees it takes with it, um, you know, are basically searching for a home. And yep. once they find a suitable location, they, you know, they go to work to, to establish okay. a new hive with the comb and what have you, so. For sure. Yeah. Great. Um, okay, another question. Uh, is it the amount of honey produced that determines the success of a hive, not just financially, but uh, in nature as well, that they produce more offspring and expand building the hive? Uh, well, the, the bees them t have a tendency to, to build to within their environment. Right. So, um, you know, with, with commercially made hives, a Langstroth hive that, that most beekeepers, the commercial beekeepers use, um, we kind of, you know, manage the population and manage things to, to contain the bees to that, you know, to that uh, box and, you know, keep them as productive as possible. And that includes the, the honey as a... As, uh, sort of a benefit of that yeah. um but uh in the wild depending on their environment they'll they can if it's a hollow tree stump i mean they will fill that entire hollow tree stump and if for example they happen to you know and you can go on youtube there's some spectacular you know uh uh you know video of where they built a hive and in, in the inside you know in in the walls yeah. of a house or something like yeah. that that take up the entire side of a house exactly so the, they the tend chimneys. to build to their environment and uh mm -hmm. and that's con the confinement of their environment is what sort of you know uh creates those swarms and the and the hive you know leaving yeah. to to uh to set up the, and establish a new hive so as long as they've got space and room they'll just keep growing yeah uh, so and that's a good point you mentioned about the inside of your walls, or I always see them in, in the chimneys that literally are, they've built up the chimneys, right? Like they are keeping it yeah. together. So if you do run into that in your house, what do you recommend? <laughs> well, the first thing to do is establish that they are in fact honeybees. Um, in Ontario, uh, I'm not sure about the other provinces, but the uh, uh, exterminators are not allowed to, kill honeybees yeah so uh uh yeah once you've established the fact that they are indeed honeybees then uh there are 
well, obviously beekeepers is the first person you want to call in some Got sort. Um, you know, in the GTA, there's uh, even a, a company called Bee Rescue. Uh, and it's kind of a network of beekeepers that, uh, okay. depending on where you're located and what have you, they'll, uh, they'll hopefully dispatch somebody to, that can come out and help you. Um, you know, depending on where it is, I mean, it, it does sometimes involve cutting holes and walls and, and, yeah. uh, you know, uh, yeah, it, it can <laughs> be, it can be a bit messy, uh, but. Yeah, you know, if done right, the you know the hive and the queen is kept intact and relocated to a to yeah. a couple of to a bee box or two, depending on the size of it, uh, in in somebody's uh, apiary. Yeah, so. that's great. Okay, um, do you have an opinion on flow hives that are promoted for backyard beekeeping? Are you familiar with that? I'm yeah, I'm familiar with the flow hive. I don't own any. Uh, yeah, you know what they. They work. They work the way they advertise. Um, there are some challenges around, uh, basically around maintaining the size of the, the colony within the, the flow hive. Okay. But uh, but no, they, they they work as advertised. And uh, uh, yeah, I, uh, everything I've heard about them, they they work as they were. I mean, they're not practical from a commercial beekeeping standpoint. But uh, yeah, it's probably. You know, uh, yeah, I don't really have an opinion because I haven't actually used one. But, uh, sure. but sure. you know, yeah, we were all very skeptical when they first came out. But uh, they, you know, they seem to be working fairly well. Sure. So. That's great. And then just continuing off of that question, um, the same individual says, I can't lift the supers and have no harvesting equipment. So would you recommend they, they get some or what could they do? Well, I mean, that's one of the things that Flow Hive helps you know, reduce the need for all of that. Got um, it. Yeah, so that's that's one of the you know the, that is probably the main advantage the, to the flow hive. Um, so, uh, yeah, ideally you'd want to maybe go check one out if you can find somebody that has one yeah. that's willing to to kind of let you have a good look at it and and they can tell you, uh, you know, what the limitations and what the challenges are. Um, I mean that you still have to go through all the same things that you know with a flow hive that you do with a regular hive and that's you know constantly monitoring and treating for you know the parasite the bromites and vora destructor and the other diseases and stuff so um but it does eliminate the the need for extracting equipment sure. so the other thing too is if you join a beekeeping association in your area that's quite cool. often the you know other beekeepers and and or the association themselves will have some extracting equipment and stuff that can uh that they you know loan out or rent out and uh you know and again you can always get some help with from the fellow beekeepers you know you help them with their extraction and they'll come over and help you with yours mm -hmm. and uh you know help handle those heavy heavy supers those honey that's supers great. yeah so. that's great it really is like a big community right everyone's looking out for each other That's yeah cool. yeah especially at the amateur level and and stuff there's uh yeah everybody's very supportive that's great love your suggestions um okay another question is what do you look for to tell it's a honeybee and not a native species so maybe meaning um a wasp or a hornet or something like that uh yeah i mean the sort of the there's certainly physiological differences between wasps and bees, uh, right. you know, with the, the sort of extra large, you know, thorax and, and what have you, the wasps. Um, yeah, the honeybee is, it's mostly by color and I know that color can vary a, a fair amount, but they are really, uh, you know, light tan, almost a golden, almost a honey color themselves. Right. Um, you know, versus, uh, like carpenter bees and, and mason bees that have a tendency to be much darker uh, and larger. Uh, yeah, without having a sort of a chart or some photos or something like that, some visual aids to, to share. Um, yeah, it's hard to describe the difference. Yeah, So. for sure. For sure. That's great. Um, how often do you have to go to Sheridan to check on our hives? Uh, because they're a new install, it's less often. 
um, yeah. just just because they're just to give them time. I know they've got to build up so there isn't any issues with any kind of, you know, uh, space. They've got lots of space to keep on uh, growing. And uh, although part of that is managing the, the, the honey boxes on the top when they get full to be adding a, a new one for them. Um, so uh, probably about once every 10 days. Okay. I'll, I'll stop by. Sometimes it's just a real quick visit, uh, just, you know, uh, to look at the entrance, make sure the bees are coming and going and, and maybe lift the lid just to, to get a, you know, feel for what's happening. And then there's other visits where I do break it down like we did in the workshop and, you know, go through all the frames and have a look and make sure that everything is, is as it should be inside the hive. Got it. So. Okay. That's good. Still, 10 days is quite a lot, I thought. <laughs> So. Yeah, there there are some stretches in the summer where we call them dearth, which is uh, we just sort of we're just coming out of that period of time now, late in July and, and uh, you know, early August, where there's much less for the bees to forage on. Okay. Um, so there you don't have to worry about the honey supers filling up as quickly. And uh, you can just, you know, that's the time if, if you're going to get any break in the summer, we can go a couple of weeks without, uh, you know, worrying too much. So. Got it. Okay. Um, so this is a question about nighttime. So what do they do? What do they do at night? Do they sleep at all? Are they still, you know, looking for honey? And would it make a difference from gathering the honey at night for you? Or is it, do you do it more during the day? No, the bees virtually only fly during daylight hours. Okay. Um, and uh, at night, they're all in the hive. Um, and they don't sleep. But uh, in the summer, they're, you know, it's, it's not uncommon to see a, what we call a beard of bees on the front of the hive fanning to keep some airflow and keep the regulate, help regulate the temperature inside. Okay. Um, when the bees come back from foraging and they have the nectar and stuff, uh, they pass, they actually pass it on to another bee. Okay. And that, that nectar changes hands several times before it's actually put into the actual comb. Okay. And each time that changes hands, they, uh, they add, you know, they're adding enzymes and stuff to the, to the nectar and helping to dehydrate the nectar to get it down to, uh, uh a manageable, uh, moisture content. Oh. So there's a lot of that. I mean, you know, talk about a little bit about, you know, the, at night the bees are moving the honey and stuff. So they, they, they work 24 seven, but, uh, they are, they're not out foraging during the, during the night. Wow. So. Re How interesting. They really are an incredible species. Like they are. Remarkable. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. is great. Okay. So. Well, we have time for a couple more questions. So, the Sheridan community is going to be able to enjoy the honey um, from the Sheridan Student Union Food Services, but how is that honey made and how do you get it out of the hives? Uh, okay, uh, well, uh, you know, as the bees uh, collect the nectar and uh, they have a, st a stomach specifically, you know, for they have two stomachs, so they have the, the stomach for the nectar. And as they return to the hive, they pass that on, as we were just talking about, mm -hmm. and and uh, it eventually gets put into a, into the, into the comb, into the okay. uh, into a cell, and uh, you know part of that fanning and and controlling the uh, the climate inside the hive is to help that honey or that nectar to cure, and once it hits about sixteen percent moisture content, that's when they put the wax seal on it and so okay. once that wax seal goes on just like uh you know when you're jarring you know uh, preserves and things like that once uh once that lid goes on uh it's you know it's stored for good um okay. so when it comes time to get the the honey off the hive we actually use a well what i use there's a few different methods but the most common is what we call a um a bee escape Oh. And it's a it's another sort of board that goes between the brood of the hive and the honey supers that are stacked on top, and it's a bit of a maze. And it's the the bees can find their way out of the maze, but they can't find their way back in. Oh. 
Oh. So over a course of a couple of days, because they go in, they store the honey, they go back down into the into the bottom box to uh, to get more honey that, uh, and nectar to bring back up. They get you know trapped on the wrong side of the the uh, the escape, okay. and so eventually those boxes on top are are virtually empty of bees. It takes a couple of days. Um, but eventually, uh, there's very few to no bees left in those boxes, and then that's when when I come along and take them <laughs> off and and uh, you know take them back to uh, to the honey house for extraction. So okay, wow, that's very interesting. I love the yeah. maze scenario. I'm visualizing that in my head. <laughs> yeah, it's just uh, yeah, it's virtually it's virtually a little a little maze. So, yeah. you know, oh, that's awesome. Okay. A couple more questions. Um, do you commercial, commercial winter wraps or can you craft your own homemade solution like tarps or anything else? Um, I do use uh, commercial wraps um, just because the cost of materials by the time I go out and, you know, uh, find a way to put it all together uh, really isn't all that cost, uh, cost effective sure. um but no it's 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 easy to um to you know to wrap the hives it doesn't have to be anything terribly thick and in insulation it's really as much as anything it's, it's the block the wind okay. and stuff to help uh just add an extra layer i mean uh yeah there's uh, the, the biggest thing is that you want to avoid anything that's going to trap moisture so okay. anything that's going to trap moisture against the hive or certainly inside the hive um, my wraps are as simple as their black plastic coroplast that are designed to slide over top of the hive. And then I put some insulation, uh, usually in the form of just straw on the top of the hive on inside under the lid, because, you know, most of the heat is, is, uh, you know, is losses through the roof, through the, through the top of the hive. So uh, I use straw because it'll absorb moisture and not uh, create too much condensation inside the hive, which is, is uh, very bad for the winter. So, but yeah, I mean, there's lots of home, home solutions to be able to do it yourself. That's great. So. I love that. That is an option, right? It always doesn't have to be something, you know, really no. super expensive. You can kind of craft your own and figure out what works best for you. Yeah. That's great. That's so. great. Well, I can't believe time's up already. Um, it's almost seven o'clock. So that was just so, so wonderful. And beha on behalf of Sheridan College, Sheridan Student Union, uh, we would just like to thank you so much for your time. Um, tonight was very informative and very eye-opening. And it feels like a lot of people were you know, really tuning in and listening and having their own questions. And it seems like a lot of people at home are, you know, doing something similar or have interest in, in, you know, the bees, which is so wonderful to see. Yeah, no, that um, is great. It, it is great. And as you, you know, you're able to teach us all tonight how important honeybees are, uh, especially to our ecosystem and how we all have a part in, you know, trying to help save the bees. So thank you for, you know, educating us all, educating us all. Um, before we go, Ted, I did have one very important question for you. Is okay. Where can we purchase your honey? I have some of Ted's honey right now. And I'm wondering where we can get more of it. <laughs> well, actually, sad to say, or maybe I should be happy to say at this very moment in time, I am sold out uh, oh! uh, because I haven't harvested my uh, honey yet, which starts the harvest actually starts in the next uh, week or two. Okay. Um, and uh, actually just uh, through my website, I'm doing uh, curbside uh uh, sales and or you know there's delivery for larger orders um, but uh, uh, in the next couple of weeks uh, the new crop of you know 2020 honey will be available uh, through my through my website awesome. so that is you can wonderful. just con reach out reach out and contact me there so great yes we will will include uh, your website and all of our communications to our audience tonight to make sure that they have it and can get in contact with you if they if they would like to purchase an order and they should all appreciate their jars because what is it isn't it two thousand bees went into this <laughs> well that that jar probably about 500 but their okay. entire life their entire life's work right right bees okay. or more yes yeah so, so funny yeah. well 
Um, well, thank you again, Ted. And of course, a big thank you to all of you at home who joined us. We are so grateful to have you all part of our sharing community. And we love being able to host uh, fun events like this and bringing back some of our you know, favorite Sheridan um, people like Ted. So thank you so much for coming back. And if you are interested in attending more events like this, be sure to check out our website at um, alumni.sheridancollege.ca and check out some of our upcoming virtual events. Uh, thank you all again for joining us. Uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. Take care. Good night. And thank you again, Ted. Yep. Yeah, Love thanks for having you. me. No, really enjoyed it. Good. I'm glad. Thanks, everyone. Yep. Bye. Bye.